Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and I'm delighted once again to have special guest David Lowe on the show. Welcome back, David. How are you keeping? I'm keeping very good. Uh, great to be here again. It's getting to be a regular thing now. So let's, let's see how we get on this time. Yeah, you're going for your testimonial. I think you've been on eight times, but that's brilliant. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. And when we spoke at the beginning of the season, we were moving into the unknown. And what you did back then is you gave us an idea, David, of the financial impact of COVID on Celtic Football Club and the wider football landscape. We are now at uh, a stage where there's a massive rebuild, there's a major rebuild. We're going to talk all about that. We're going to talk about Celtic Share, the Celtic Trust, uh, um, and some of the failings that have happened at the club since we last spoke. So, in a nutshell, David, where did it all go wrong and where do we go from here as a football club? Well, you've referenced, uh, you know, the start of the season, COVID. Uh, I personally have always had the view, you know, that it was very unlikely that we'd ever be in any, we'd be in Celtic Park at any point this season. And that, that's what's transpired. And yeah, frankly, it's had a disastrous effect on football clubs across Europe. So it's been disastrous for Celtic. You know, it's a dramatic word, so we'll just stick with it. But it's, it's dramatic for uh, disastrous for everybody else. Uh, not having uh, all that discretionary spend, then having to uh, sell season tickets for a season where you still don't have any clarity as to what's going to happen going forward with the virus. And you're asking for money off supporters who receive next to nothing for the 25 million in Celtics instance that was shelled out this time last season. So it's not it's not a very good economic backdrop dot for any football club at this moment in time. I think it's even worse uh, when you've had a disappointing season because supporters like Celtic have are disillusioned, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the financial situation comes into play as well. So it's not a very healthy backdrop for Celtic, which is the club we are interested in, obviously. No, absolutely. Now, a lot of Celtic fans, and the other night, in fact, David, you know, the the Aberdeen game, yes, it's a dead rubber, as much of a dead rubber as a Celtic game can be. A lot of Celtic fans are looking at that and thinking, well, we've shelled out for the virtual season ticket, subscriptions to various channels, and then various one-off games. And Axom, uh, we refused to buy it, and we ended up covering the women's game instead. Uh, That was our small uh, protest against the amount of money that we've had to shell out. But we've been promised extra value as Celtic fans David, have we had that this season? Well clearly we haven't, so we've had a disappointing football season sometimes these things happen so we'll put that to one side but this time last year or in March last year, the club Celtic you know, appealed to our heart strings with all the platitudes about how magnificent we are and how faithful we are and come join us, chase the 10. You know, it's all there in writing, you know, and we went for it big time and we put in 25 million into the unknown because we didn't know what we were getting because the virus was just kicking off. Uh, But uh, I don't think too many thought it was going to last the season. I thought an awful lot, I think an awful lot of Celtic fans thought, well, I'm definitely buying my season ticket because I want that seat when we get the 10 because this virus should be over by then. That was a big selling point, the 10, having your seat for the, the 10. And on that basis, you know, all the season tickets were sold and uh, sold out. And on the 23rd of June, Celtic put a press release out saying, thank you for your support. You're brilliant, this, brilliant, that. Let's go for it. Let's go for it together. And we all started off on our... A merry journey full of the enthusiasm of the day. And, uh, of course, it was a downhill from then on. But that, that's what happened a year ago. And here we are, you know, uh, a year later, and it's been disastrous uh, in, in terms of everything we've talked about there, Paul John. So there you go. You know, when we're looking at the, the disastrous nature of it, um, as football fans, and we've done it on Axon, David, you look at the team, you look at the manager, uh, and a lot of the time the criticism lies there. But we've gone deeper than that this season because we have looked at the the highest echelons of Celtic Park and we're looking at Dermot Desmond and we're asking the question, you know, what are you going to do to put this right? We've looked at Peter Lowell and said, uh, how much of the blame lies on your shoulders? And of course, we've also got Ian Bank here, a chairman who doesn't really communicate with the fan base. When you're looking to 
where it went wrong and who to uh, apportion blame to. I mean, how big is that blame on those figures that I've mentioned? Before we speak about Neil Lennon and the players and everything that went wrong there, Dermot Desmond, Peter Lowell, Ian Bankier. Well, a blame is not a word I, I use or a word I like. Responsibility is a word I prefer. Who's responsible for this? Why has this happened and how has it happened? And you can look at it from two different viewpoints. You can look at it in a narrow sense from the football point. But I, I think the correct way to look at it is from the PLC point. Who is responsible for this? Who's in charge? The board are in charge uh, of the situation. And they have ultimate responsibility for everything that's gone wrong. That is where the buck stops. It's the board that appoints the manager. It's the board that has been increasingly interfering with the football department, dare, dare I say. And this is where the buck stops because they're responsible for this. And there has, to, there has to be some changes. Now, you, you, they then start to dissect the board. I mean, the board has a chairman, uh, a guy called Ian Bankier. It has another four non-executive directors who are supposed to challenge the executive directors on the, on the way that the business has been run uh, and challenge, challenge the executive directors of challenging the CEO and challenging the finance director. Uh, but ultimately, it's the chairman that's uh, legally responsible for overseeing this. And all of this is uh, referred to and narrated in the report and accounts every year. You know, it says the bank here makes a statement saying, I am the leader of the board. You know, then there's a whole lot of verbiage that fo uh, follows. That is the actual situation. So that is where uh, responsibility lies. When things go well and when things go badly, it, you know, you've got to take the rough with the smooth. But then when you sort of drill down deeper, you look at the, the board and the ownership profile. At the end of the day, although Dermot Desmond is a non-executive shareholder, he's also the cornerstone shareholder owner. He's a de facto controlling shareholder because a whole lot of lost votes. And basically, he calls the shot. So, I mean, we can sugarcoat this and sugarcoat that. But it's the Dermot show. You know, he's also sort of non-resident, so he's sort of uh, absent a lot of the time. So that's fair enough. Nothing wrong with any of that. Uh, if you look at it from the position that Dermot Desmond has, that's fine. But it's how you wield your influence, how you uh, affect the direction of the company that uh, really matters. And, and, and I think there's a feeling there. Now, I or Celtic Trust are not criticising Dermot Desmond's uh, support for Celtic. That's there to be seen. He is a Celtic supporter. Nobody can take that away from him. He has stood up when it was counted in the past. He has invested in four of the five share issues that Celtic have had since Fergus McCann took over. He's invested over £35 million pounds or around £35 million pounds in these share, uh, share offers. Uh, uh, the last one being 2005. Uh, having said that, he's also received over £6 million worth of uh, dividends. That's fair enough as well, uh, because he's not the only one that's uh, received those dividends. Uh, he's received them more because he's bought more shares. So all of that's fine and beyond criticism. But it's what you do with that status that matters. And I think uh, we have a very weak board. I think we have a very weak chairman. Uh, and I think we have a very stale uh, board of non-executive directors. Uh, and I think some changes are necessary. I think that board needs freshened up. It certainly needs a new chairman. Uh, corporate governance, Celtic continually crow about how superb their corporate governance is. That's not true. Celtic's corporate governance is poor. They, ha they have, a, as an aim-listed company on the stock exchange, they have a code of con conduct to abide by. They have chosen to abide by uh, that of the Quoted Company Alliance, and their guidelines say that uh, it is not good to have non-executive directors uh, in situ uh, for more than nine years because after that period of time, they are not deemed to be independent. 
they're not deemed to, uh, to be uh, performing uh, the true definition of, of the role and responsibility of a non-executive director. Well, we've got four of them. We've got four directors, including the chairman, that have been there for over nine years. And because they've been there for that long, uh, you know, they have to get re-elected every year rather than by rotation, which is the norm. So if you look at it from an investment perspective, investors look at it, you know, you can be a Celtic shareholder without necessarily being a, a Celtic fan. But if you're an investor, you're an owner. You're a part owner. The Celtic Trust is a part owner of Celtic. Uh, the Celtic Trust uh, and other shareholders look at these things and they look at these things and say that's not good. Uh, the corporate governance should be improved. Uh, the board should be improved. Uh, lots of things could, could be done better. There's three committees that say public limited companies have and AIM companies have. One of them is the nominations committee. This is the committee that's supposed to meet uh, on a, re a fairly regular basis. Well, Celtic have had no meetings of the nominations committee. This is a committee that determines what the composition of the board should be. Uh, is what we have good enough? Could we be doing better? Well, it wasn't even deemed important enough. We will get David back back in on the discussion. Uh, we are talking Celtic's uh, downfall this season. Who is responsible for that? And obviously, what we'll also be speaking about is how Celtic come out the other end of this particular season with everything else that has um, been involved in that, including the COVID and how that's going to, to harm the financial rebuilding of the Celtic football team and also the club as well, because obviously it goes to the, the very top of the tree. And David Lowe has appeared on A Celtic State of Mind on a number of occasions um, to discuss the, the financial element of the club, because... For everybody who is tuning in, you'll be aware that David Lowe was a financial advisor for Fergus McCann when Fergus took over the club, saved the club back in the early 90s. And it's always a pleasure to get David in. So we will be um, linking back into him. I'm going to stay live and I'll be chatting to you and reading your comments until David comes back in. So thanks everybody for getting involved. And you are tuning in on Twitter, Facebook and all also on YouTube, so that if you do have any questions, come in, ask David Lowe, and uh, hopefully he can answer them. Obviously, um, there's big questions to be to be asked around the, the running of the club, and what David was talking about there was that there's a boardroom that needs to be freshened up, and one of the biggest uh, kind of queries, one of the biggest debates that we've had over the piece this season is the fact that the club has not engaged sufficiently with the supporters and often you feel that they really don't know what the true feeling of the fans is um, and one of the suggestions that's been made in the past is that there should be fan representation on the board so if you are tuning in and you're listening in via Twitter, Facebook or YouTube what are your thoughts on that what's your thoughts on fan representation uh, on the Celtic board would it work uh, would that re-engage the fan base with the Celtic football club sometimes you feel as though there are faceless entities at Celtic um, and obviously you know Dermot Desmond has been criticised for that as well um, but as David Lowe was saying earlier on, it's not something that uh, he nor the Celtic Trust are trying to suggest, you know, that Dermot Desmond is not a true Celtic fan. Um, I think his level of investment is there for all to see. And what we're trying to do at Celtic State of Mind is offer a platform for David, for Celtic Shared, because we spoke to them a few weeks ago, uh, and also for the Celtic Trust and what they're hoping to achieve. Uh, they've been working for some time um, on being organised so that we can make a, a big difference to the way the club is run. Now, David, you are appearing again on the screen and hopefully your connection will uh, go live again. Uh, I can see you. Uh, can you hear us, David? Yeah, I can hear now, yeah. So Brilliant, you you're back, <laughs> you're back. It's okay, uh, I waffled on for five minutes until you came back. Um, yes, so we're talking about the board and obviously the fact that it needs freshened up, David. It needs freshened yeah. up the board. I would agree with that and I think one of the biggest things that Celtic fans have been unhappy with this season is the fact that there's been a real uh, disengagement between the fan base and the club. Do you think that fan representation on the board would bridge the gap? 
Uh, well, it could do, but not 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 for sure because uh, what happens when a fan and remember there are fans. Uh, a fan is a Celtic supporter, somebody who supports the club and everything that it is. And, so you're dropping out again there, David. Uh, hopefully your connection will come back in because there is plenty to discuss in relation to the uh, situation at Celtic and where we go on a financial level. So it looks as though you've dropped out for the time being. We'll continue to chat amongst ourselves and amongst the, the comments that are coming in until you reconnect. Feed the Bear comes in actually to make the point. Ask him if we Fergus would come back. I would have him back right away. Well, I think back to those days... Um, as I'm sure a lot of you uh, do and um, with you know fondness in that we were able to save the club we as Celtic fans and the, the figurehead and the man who made that possible obviously was Fergus McCann and I know that David was very close to Fergus and uh, is still in touch with Fergus and you wonder what someone like Fergus McCann would make of all of this um, Celtic Football Club have dominated, and I'm going to go on to uh, a point that Michelle Sharon makes. Um, we have dominated Scottish football for a long time, and Michelle says that uh, a board who got caught sleeping are largely to blame. No challenge and lots of trophies. Going backwards, Europe should have been the warning. And I remember the banner that was unfurled at Celtic Park uh, by the Green Brigade. Uh, warning. The club warning the ones making the decisions not to be caught out sleeping at the wheel. And it's exactly what's happened. So when we're now looking at a situation where there is um, a lack of players coming through the youth system, where we've got so many players who... Um, have not been value for money, fit for purpose even on some occasions, and many of those will be shipped out this pre-season. It's quite clear that two of the biggest aspects of the footballing department, uh, being the recruitment and also the youth development, has failed. And that doesn't happen overnight. Michelle. So obviously over the, the period of a number of years, these elements haven't been working at Celtic and it's all come home to roost. Now, I remember in previous podcasts, Kevin Graham speaking about the fact that the issues we were facing this season was due to, um, you know, a long period of time where the, the board weren't functioning properly and he was criticised for it. Because I think people looked upon that and said, well, how could they not be um, fit for purpose or doing their job um, competently if we were able to have so much success? And I think that sometimes success uh, can blind us, you know, because it masks uh, a million deficiencies or, or sins. And I think that has happened in the past. Now, David uh, is trying to get back online um, and he is in the waiting room. So I'm going to hopefully bring him back into the discussion in just a second once it looks as though um, he is ready. And then obviously some of these questions that are coming in, I will be able to, to ask David them himself. David obviously is the chairman of the Celtic Trust. And he has come on and spoken to a Celtic state of mind a number of times about the work that the Celtic Trust have been doing. I'm going to try and bring David back in now. Um, David, I can hear you. I can see you. Uh, can you hear and see us? <laughs> Brilliant. Take three. I Take can three. now. So uh, I don't, maybe it's a bad internet connection. <laughs> Yeah, No, that's good. Okay. That, that's sounding go. and looking great. Just while you were away there, David, someone came in, uh, Michelle Sharon came in, uh, sorry, Feed the Bear came in to ask um, about Fergus McCann. And it just makes me wonder, what would Fergus think of what's going on at Celtic at this moment in time? Uh, well, that I don't know. I mean, I don't think he would be uh, too critical. At the end of the day, uh, what's happened has only happened in, the, in, in one season you know, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of people, and I'm not saying this is Fergus McCann's view, that think you can't win everything forever. Uh, with one a quadruple travel, sometimes you you lose leagues. It happens. It's football, and uh, he may be of that view. I don't know, but if you're close to the action uh, and you see games on a regular basis, you're familiar with the corporate backdrop. Uh, uh, you can see for yourself that things have gone wrong and that a lot of uh, cracks were getting papered over, you know, in the period since uh, Rangers were liquidated. So for much of the last nine years, uh, there has been no serious, credible uh, opposition 
you know, Rangers weren't in the Premier League or the new Rangers weren't in the Premier League for for half of the time. And then for the other half, you know, they've been playing catch up and spending a, a whole lot of money and issuing a whole lot of shares. Uh, so I, I think most think people think, you know, we have we could have done a lot better than we have done. And, uh, you know, things have been going wrong since uh, Brendan Rogers left. And uh, the recruitment policy has not been good. There's mm-hmm. lots of things that have gone wrong, and I think that's the common view. But I wouldn't know exactly what Fergus thought in these matters. I do know he's got concerns about uh, the possibility of a hostile takeover. I mean, that, that I, know, I know he shares my concerns in that respect. Mm-hmm. The fact that you know Celtic's share ownership profile is controlled by two shareholders. You know, Dermot, who I spoke about earlier, uh, and. Uh, an investment company called Linzel Train. So, uh, you know, Linzel Linzel Train are professional investors. They have no emotional investment in Celtic. Uh, their investment in Celtic is is designed to to make money. I mean, they're in the business of making money for their unit holders or their shareholders. So they've bought Celtic shares because they expect to make money. And if the price is right, you know, they would sell their shares, uh, mm-hmm. the same as they would sell any other shares. Uh, and, you know, that, that's why they own Celtic shares. So that, that's a concern, you know, that control is vested in uh, amongst two shareholders. Uh, obviously, Dermot is not an, an emotional, uh, he is an emotional investor because uh, Celtic shares haven't been a good investment. Let's be clear about that. Most Celtic supporters uh, or most of the shareholders are Celtic supporters. Most of the shareholders haven't bought shares to make money. Most of the shareholders, including the Celtic Trust, you know, have bought shares because they want to own a part of Celtic, uh, because they want to have a say in the running of Celtic. That's why you buy share, shares for those two reasons. And a lot or most Celtic shareholders are unconcerned about the price of the shares. As it happens, the you know the shares have import, uh, performed incredibly poorly since Fergus McCann left. And they lost sixty percent of their value. So that you know it's not exactly a good investment. You know from a stock exchange uh, perspective, you know the buying of Celtic shares. So it does make you wonder, uh, you know, why Linzel Train have bought eighteen percent of Celtic in the last few years. Uh, and I think there's a reason for that. The reason has actually been in the news this week, jurisdictional change. Uh, I think an investor like uh, Linzel Train owns shares in Celtic because they are betting or gambling, for want of a better phrase, on mm-hmm. Celtic ending up in a, a different jurisdiction than this sort of uh, little backwater in Scotland. Because if that were to happen, a Celtic were to get into a more lucrative, financially lucrative a jurisdiction like a British League or an Atlantic League or even a Super League of a fashion, the revenue profile would change dramatically and the shares would, would uh, you know, for example, only quadruple. Mm-hmm. So you saw a taste of that yesterday when there was a couple of newspaper articles. The powers that be in England could be interested in having Celtic in a British League of, and the shares went up. At the mere at the mere suggestion of, of Celtic being involved in the British League, the, the share price went up. That's <laughs> that's exactly what we want to talk about, uh, David. Because I think in the past we um, have spoken to David Lowe around, and he will come back in. Hopefully, he'll move into another room, and we'll get a connection. We spoke to David about the situation back in the late. 90s. Uh, what happened then was that Celtic, who were actively looking to join the English League, um, had Wimbledon Football Club valued uh, with the, the view uh, to actually purchase in the club, buy in Wimbledon Football Club, renaming the club. Uh, changing the registered address, and I'm going back to 1998 here. Uh, and then Celtic would be Celtic would have a club playing in the the English league, and that was the plan back then. Uh, David came on to Axon 
probably about a year ago and we spoke about um, those days and David himself was, was looking into the Trojan horse movement as it were of having a Scottish team playing in an Irish league to test the water. So so David, just before you dropped out there, you were talking about the share price increasing at the mere suggestion that Celtic would be part of a British league. Is that something now that you feel the club will be pursuing? So look, we're in one of those periods where change is in the air. It's happened before. You know, if you want to go way back, you know, uh, when Thatcher and Reagan came in, they opened up the financial markets uh, and all of a sudden you got all these international owners interested in football clubs and, and uh, you know, television companies took stakes in football clubs and, you know, that and clubs came to the stock market. You know, that, that was a period of great change and, and uh uh, that's a generation ago. Uh, you also had, you know, the formation of the English Premiership, the Scottish Premiership in 1992 and 1998. You know, that, that was uh, all about uh, creating a bigger financial cake for fewer clubs. And, uh, you know, that, that happened in Scotland in 98. Uh, there have been perennial attempts to... Uh, or the holy grail for a lot of Celtic uh, people, not all Celtic people, is... We are a global brand, you know, with a global supporter base. We're a big fish in a small pond. We want to test ourselves uh, against oppositions in other countries on a more regular basis. I'm actually into that school of thought myself as someone that's grown up, uh, you know, with a very successful Celtic uh, in Europe when I was uh, a kid. Uh, So many among Celtic, I think it's a view in the boardroom as well, we love Celtic to... uh, to uh, compete uh, amongst their peers uh, on a different stage and leave, and dare I say it, leave a lot of the problems we have with the institutions in Scotland behind. Mm. You know, I don't think we're a loved club uh, amongst football circles, but maybe that's another podcast for another day. So uh, up, coming up to date, there is a, uh, the winds of change, I think, are blowing again. Uh, that was evidenced by, you know, this Super League, which was all about greed, you know, creating a huge financial cake, cutting it into, uh, you know, 12 or 15 slices and uh, uh, creating a lot more money and revenues uh, for those that were in the league at the expense of those that weren't. So I, I, I think that's not the end of it. I think that is probably the start of it, the start of change, uh, change in the uh, league structures, change in a uh, broadcasting, uh, streaming, etc. Everything we're growing up with, I think, is going to get challenged because technology is enabling it to, to go over the top or OTT with streaming services to a, a global audience and a, a much cheaper basis, more profitable basis for clubs. So we're living in an environment of change uh, and uh, I, I personally would hope that you know Celtic are, are part of that change because I, 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 I think your aspirations should be more than trying to just win the Scottish League year in, year out. Uh, but that's just a personal view. That's not even a view of the uh, Celtic Trust in case they get pulled up by committee members for <laughs> for saying things on their behalf. That's my personal view. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say there, about a year ago, you and I were having a chat about um, the fact that all bets were off. We went back to the 1990s and we spoke about how Celtic were actively looking to, to move the operation completely um, out of the Scottish leagues. Uh, there was a couple of different occasions. There was the occasion where we were looking at the English league and obviously there was a, a valuation of Wimbledon Football Club. Then there was the purchase, obviously, of the Trojan horse to see if we could move a club from Scotland to Ireland. I found that fascinating. Then there was implications because the rules were changed. And then in Alan McDonald's time, he was looking at the Atlantic yeah. League as well. So, you know, all this time later, 20 odd years later the biggest change to that I feel is the the fallout of Covid what I find quite interesting this week is that as football fans we were all very critical of the the proposals for the European Super League and would it be hypocritical for Celtic to be on board a different league that took us out of Scotland um, because I know I'm, I'm like yourself I want the best for Celtic I want us to perform on a European level and um, in order to do that I don't think uh, you know we're hamstrung by trying to operate in the Scottish leagues for a number of reasons um, but if we were to pursue that move to a British British League, for example, um, would it be hypocritical for Celtic to do that? 
It could be uh, hypocritical for Celtic to do that, but we've, it's all about how it's presented and, and in the fine detail. Uh, it, is it hypocritical for Celtic to use that example to leave the Scottish League in total and to join another league in England and to be the best they can be in that English league? Uh, it would only be hypocritical if if it was at somebody else's expense, uh, if somebody was prejudiced uh, as a consequence of, you know, Celtic doing that. Uh, I want Celtic to uh, do well and to compete against its peer groups in in, in Europe. That's I, I'm much more interested in personally speaking in Celtic doing well in Europe than 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 uh, than what we have just now. I don't like a lot of the baggage that comes with uh, being in Scotland. I don't like the treatment that Celtic gets. I don't like some of the uh, support from uh, or the things we have to put up with here. I, I would rather leave all that by, um, behind. But that's that's me personally speaking. I don't think it's uh, hypocritical. Celtic have been flirting with this idea on and off uh, since the 1990s. There was a talk a, a pre-1998 of Celtic acquiring for want of the horrible phrase I've got to use the horrible phrase the franchise of an English club and rebranding it you know and rebranding a, a, an English football franchise is basically changing its registered ground in England to Glasgow changing its name from whatever it is to Celtic and changing its colours from whatever they were to uh, Celtics. So there was a club kicking about at the time called, well, there is still a club, uh, Wimbledon, because I think it's now in the, uh, the the English Football League system now. But basically they were homeless. They had been thrown out of Plough Lane. They had a sort of very small support. The guys that they owned them uh, at the time were sort of touting it round uh, for sale. And uh, there was some loose talk of Celtic buying the Wimbledon franchise and doing all the things I just mentioned there. And suddenly you have uh, Celtic, as it was, if my memory serves me correct, in the, what is now called the English English Championship. And that was done uh, in, in a pre, what's called a, a, a FIFA plenary in 1998, because roughly the same time, you know, I was involved in a in, in a similar thing with Clydebank Football Club. The owners had sold the uh, the, the stadium Kilbowie to a supermarket company, and the uh, for over two million quid or something. And Clydebank had become had, at the time where uh, Scotland's newest club, they'd sort of joined the. Uh, the the what was then the Scottish Football League having take to, would you believe taken over the franchise of East Stirlingshire uh, and uh, operated as ES Clydebank for a season before the decision was reversed by the football authorities East Stirling became East Stirling again and Clydebank were admitted to the league uh, as Clydebank um, uh, so. AFL, the SFL in nineteen in the mid sixties, and by the mid nineties they had basically no ground and a tiny amount of fans, and they were sort of nomads, shuffling between uh, Greenock and uh, Morton's ground and Dumbarton's ground. So uh, there are some investors basically bought the club and relocated it to Dublin, you know, which yeah, and they had got as far as. Uh, uh, hiring the Royal Dublin Showground, I think it was called, in Ballsbridge, and intended to play out of there in, whilst in the Scottish League. David looks to be dropping back out, unfortunately. The signal might be lost, and uh, we hope that that will be regained. Um, fascinating discussion around what Celtic have tried to do previously in relation to the Super League, uh, the British League that has been uh, proposed this week. Celtic and also Rangers have been discussed as potentially joining a British League. We've spoken about it a couple of times on Axom, and it is fascinating to get David's view on it. Um, if we are 
are able to uh, reconnect with David, I want to ask him finally around Celtic Shared, which is uh, an initiative that the Celtic Trust are involved in, along with the Green Brigade. And uh, they will be speaking very, very soon uh, to uh, a wide audience online. Uh, But it would be interesting to see where they are. We spoke to the Green Brigade a few weeks ago on a Celtic State of Mind, all all about uh, Celtic Shared and uh, we were also going to speak to David about their plans to expand on the, the ideas that they've had around the Celtic Trust, how they're involved with Celtic Shared uh, and the Green Brigade in relation to what we hope to achieve. Um, we did speak uh, to David about fan representation on the board. What do you what do you think yourself about fan representation? Is that something that would um, alleviate some of the issues we've had this season with a lack of engagement? Um, we'll, we'll see over the next five minutes if David can come back in and if not, you can join us again at 12.30 for the bulletin. That will go ahead as normal. It will not be myself, it will be Tony Haggerty Jim Orr and presented by Laura Bradburn, three of the Axon team, uh, but I will try and get David back in because there's a few other uh, discuss- discussion points that we could uh, cover before the end of this particular broadcast, but that's the, the beauty of being able to go live and uh, connect with this community of Celtic fans who have been built up over the last season or so when you look at where Celtic are One of the things that's concerning me, as well as the financial element of that and how difficult the club might find selling the the season tickets without a big announcement around the manager, Um, one of the other things that I would like to to point out is the kind of moves... um, Hibs over the last uh, 18 months and Aberdeen probably over the last few weeks with the appointment of Stephen Glass and, and Scott Brown there is how they're progressing. Hibs and Aberdeen um, you know I'm looking at them and I'm thinking to myself by the time uh, of the new season they probably are going to be pretty stable in relation to um, how they're going to approach next season and I know that Aberdeen were hemorrhaging cash um, and uh, you know their owners spoke about that and what they had to do to try and alleviate these issues Hibs on the other hand I spoke to uh, Ron Gordon just a couple of weeks ago Um, thankfully I was able to uh, enter into one of the press conferences he spoke about uh, filling the gap somewhat by selling one of their star players Uh, one of the players could be Ryan Porteous um, it could also be um, Nisbet Kevin Nisbet up front as well and uh, you're looking at uh, the left back Doig I think is a great player so you know Hibs I think will be strong next season as will Aberdeen my big concern is it's taken Celtic so long to get their act together in relation to getting the manager in place that, you know what, uh, next season might be difficult as well. But I will be asking David his thoughts on that as soon as we um, get back connected uh, visually and on audio. I can hear you and see you, David. How's things at your end? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Intermittent. It's fine, it's fine. You were telling us there about this incredible um, you know, attempt to get Clyde Bank based in Dublin playing in the Scottish League. Was this like a Trojan horse? Were you testing the water back then? See if it could be done? Well, if if one club does it, you, you know, it does sort of uh, suggest that a second club or a third club uh, can do it. Uh, but I, I don't know if it goes as far as calling it a Trojan horse. It might have been an effective Trojan, Trojan horse. If Clyde Bank became Dublin City playing out of Dublin in the Scottish Football League, I don't know if you heard what I was saying earlier. It's it doubled everything. It doubled the size of the Scottish League. It introduced the fourth largest city in the, the British Isles into the Scottish League. The sponsorship opportunities, the TV broadcast opportunities, all effectively doubled because you've got a new uh, five, six million uh, potential audience from the, the island of Ireland uh, uh, you know, joining or looking into your league. So uh, it was it was so good, in fact, uh, it was knocked back because uh, FIFA, uh, at the behest of the FAI and the SFA, put a proposal to the FIFA plenary before the World Cup in 1998, effectively changing the rules to prevent it. And that rule has been in place ever since in several different guises, but basically mm. it's a rule that prevents Celtic playing in a, playing in a England uh, as we speak. But I, I think all these rules are going to get challenged. Uh, I think COVID's 
Um, one thing it has done, I think it might have brought forward a whole lot of uh, forces for change in the game. Uh, that, that, that's what I think, anyway. Mm-hmm. One final thing I wanted to ask you about, David, um, because it's been tremendous that you've joined us. I know we've had a couple of connection issues, but that's that's by the by. That's just technology for you. I've been, and a lot of Celtic fans have mentioned this on the podcast, very disappointed with this lack of engagement. Now, how have the club been in terms of engagement with the Celtic Trust? And as the chairman of the Celtic Trust, David, uh, what can be done better? What would be good for you uh, as a Celtic Trust to engage with the club. Do you see that as being something that should be done sooner rather than later? And in a sense, it could almost be done in a a similar scenario um, to what we are doing just now. Yeah, the the trust proposal for um, the season tickets is is a fantastic proposal because it removes all the negativity. It basically creates a positive dynamic for season ticket holders to buy season ticket holders, season tickets, uh, after a, such a bad year, a bad experience, to introduce a whole lot of new young shareholders into the, the Celtic ownership family is a good thing and beyond criticism. Everybody that's heard about it amongst the support loves it and they love it because it's a good thing. Now, the Celtic board have had it for two months. Radio silence. Mm. Not uh, any feedback whatsoever other than uh, uh, indirect feedback that they hate it uh, that, uh, and uh, they just don't like it. It's not helpful and uh, they would rather not do it. That's a, I hope that's wrong, but that's, uh, that's a, you know, what I've heard. But after two months, uh, you would have expected some sort of uh, interface, some sort of dialogue, some sort of uh, discussion, but uh, not a thing. And that, I would say that's uh, very disappointing. It certainly is. I mean, augur well for uh, for uh, an uptake of the idea. I think Celtic, which was your original question, should be communicating better. I think they are aloof uh, and or are unaware of the unhappiness of Celtic fans. Then, then you know they have a problem. Quite frankly. David, the signal is intermittent, uh, unfortunately, but uh, we will wrap it up there. I'll get back in touch with David and um, we will hopefully speak to him again at some point. But on that last point that he made uh, in relation to the club, how good would it be if the chairman of Celtic and the chairman of the Celtic Trust were able to have a wee chat on a Celtic state of mind? I'm going to throw that out to you uh, as an audience, as the community that has come together over the last year um, to share in the disappointments and uh, make all these suggestions and ask, where is Eddie Howe? Um, but yeah, we'll wrap it up here. But I'm going to see if, uh, as a platform, a Celtic state of mind can pull that together. The chairman of Celtic, the chairman of the Celtic Trust, we will ask the question, we might even try and add uh, some kind of charitable element uh, that we can offer the club. Let's do this. Let's get you on. Let's get you talking um, to people who want change. They want change at the club. Now, uh, one final point I will make is uh, lucky if you sell 20k this year fail fail well thanks for getting involved chemical gases um, I don't think so I don't think it will get to the point where Celtic have an issue selling 20,000 season tickets but what they will have to do is they will have to make an announcement very soon and that announcement in relation um, will be a, a management a managerial appointment so where are we with that uh, radio silence, as David Lowe says, we've had radio silence for some time from the club and uh, obviously you would expect it to some degree because there's the non-disclosure um, agreement situation with anybody who has been spoken to um, about the job, so they won't be talking about it, so it's a good thing that Eddie Howe's not talking about the Celtic job. Um, but um, I, I am interested over the last couple of days at uh, some murmurings that are, are uh, coming through that... Um, an announcement may not be made soon, but certainly a decision is going to be made very, very soon in relation to the deadline that's been set. So um, we will find out one way or another, and hopefully there will be an announcement. Who knows when that will be? We've been calling out for engagement with Celtic for some time. I'm happy to say that at three o'clock this afternoon, a Celtic State of Mind will be part of their press conference. But because there's no game at this weekend, uh, we'll be focusing on the other game 
um, involving Celtic, which is the Celtic women's team. So we will be in the press conference, we will report back and we'll show you all the footage. David Lowe came on today to talk about the financial element of uh, COVID and how that affects Celtic, how it might push them down a road that we have um, looked at time and time again over the last... 20 odd years and that road being a route out of Scottish football I, th- I find it as I say fascinating to hear that Celtic were looking at the purchase of an English club it looks as though we have tried every avenue um, to move Celtic Football Club out of the Scottish leagues and due to the Covid scenario and the fact that all bets are off and a lot of rules will be changed and will be amended and updated Celtic may still play their football elsewhere what do you think of that? Talk about a wee bit more when we're back at half past 12 um, I could rap all day about this uh, it would be great if some of you guys could maybe join me at some point um, I have thought about that maybe on a, an evening from time to time um, some of the, the audience can uh, send me your email address and I'll dial you in Uh, it won't be a phone in because that would be pretty hard to manage but we might get uh, an evening Axom show uh, kicked off where uh, half a dozen of you guys can come in and get involved in this what do you think of that well if you're interested uh, get in touch with me on social media Um, you can email me at pauljohndykes at gmail.com and um, Give me your email address. Let's talk about it. Let's get you involved in a Celtic state of mind. You might even be able to help me on sniping duties uh, on the comments section. It's always an absolute pleasure to get involved with you guys and girls. Thanks very much for joining me on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. I keep saying this, but if you haven't already done so, make sure that you subscribe on our YouTube channel. We're growing it uh, every day and we're putting out live content every single day as well. We'll be back at 12.30 and I'll see you then.